Chapter Three of Rescue Dog of the High Pass. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Rescue Dog of the High Pass by Jim Kilgard. The Villager. Franz sank his razor sharp axe in the raw stump of a newly cut birch and used both hands to close his jacket against an icy wind that whistled down from the heights he looked up at the cloud-stabbing peak of little sister and smiled yesterday the snow line had been exactly even with a pile of tumbled boulders that according to some of the more imaginative residents of dornblatt resembled an old man with a pipe in his mouth today it was a full fifty yards farther down the mountain caesar who never cared how cold it was sat on his haunches and disdaining even to curl his tail around his paws faced the wind without blinking franz ruffled the big dog's ears with an affectionate hand and caesar beamed his delight franz spoke to him winter soon caesar and it is by far the very finest time of all the year let the children and old people enjoy their spring and summer winter in the alps is for the strong who can face it and for them it is wonderful indeed caesar offered a canine grin wagged his tail and flattened his ears as though he understood every word and franz by no means certain that he did not the dog understood almost everything else franz wrenched his axe from the birch stump and dangling it from one hand so that the blade pointed away from his foot he went on as his father had said nobody in dornblatt could hope to live by cutting wood and that alone every household must have a supply for wood was the only fuel but since every able-bodied householder cut his own it naturally followed that they cared to buy none franz was still unable to remember when he had enjoyed himself more completely other men of dornblatt regarded the annual wood-cutting as an irksome chore and life in the forest the loneliest existence imaginable as long as he could be in the forest it never occurred to franz that he was alone there was always caesar the finest of companions there were the mice the hares the foxes the various birds and only yesterday franz had seen thirty-one chamois on their way from the heights that soon would be blanketed beneath thirty to forty feet of snow to seek winter passage in the lowlands there had been two magnificent bucks plus a half dozen smaller ones but franz had not mentioned the herd because there were a number of eager chamois hunters in dornblatt should they learn of the chamois and succeed in overtaking them they might well slaughter the entire herd chamois franz thought were better alive than dead and it was not as though there was a lack of food in dornblatt it had been a good year as he walked on franz pondered his expulsion from professor luttman's school the sting was gone much of the shame had faded and there were no regrets whatever franz knew now that he simply did not belong in school for his was not the world of books if on occasion he met a former classmate and the other asked him how he was getting on, he merely smiled and said, Well enough. Franz remained more than a little troubled about Professor Luttman, though. He was a good and kind man, who seldom had any thoughts that did not concern helping his pupils. Franz felt that somehow he had failed Professor Luttman. The heavy axe hung almost lightly from his hand, as though somehow it was a part of his arm, franz had always regarded his axe as a beautiful and wonderful tool he could strike any tree exactly where he wished fell it exactly where he wanted it to fall and leave a smoother stump than eric erlich who owned the finest saw in dornblatt always choosing one that was rotten deformed or that had been partially uprooted by some fierce wind and was sure to topple anyhow franz had spent his time felling trees then he had trimmed their branches with a great bundle of faggots on his own back and a greater one on caesar's he had hauled them to his father's house 
Finally, he had cut the trunks into suitable lengths, and such portions as he was unable to carry, he and Caesar had dragged in. His father had finally ordered him to stop. Wood was piled about the hail house in every place where it was usually stored, and many where it was not. There was enough to last the family through this winter and most of next. If any more were brought in, the Hales would have to move out. Franz had continued to cut wood for those who were either unable to gather their own or who, at the best, would find woodcutting difficult. There was Grandpa Eisman, once a noted mountaineer who had conquered many peaks but lost his battle with time. Old and stooped, able to walk only with the aid of his cane, Grandpa Eisman's house would be cold indeed this winter if he and he alone must gather wood to heat it. And then there was Jean Greb, who lost his right hand in an accident on Little Sister. There was also... Franz knew a rising worry as he made his way toward a tree he had marked for cutting. There were not so many unable to gather their own wood that he could keep busy throughout the winter. And what then? Woodcutting was the only duty with which his father would trust him. He thought suddenly and wistfully of the hospice of St. Bernard, more than 8,000 feet up in the mountains. The hospice must have been snowbound long since. There were few days throughout the entire year when snow did not fall there, and when it was deep enough, the monks and marineers, Father Paul's strange term for lay workers, must get about on skis. Franz felt confident of his ability to keep up with him, for he had learned to ski almost as soon as he'd learned to walk. Surely the hospice must be one of the world's finest places, but Franz seemed no nearer to going there than he had been last summer. Father Paul had talked with him about it once more, and Franz had broached a very troublesome problem. If he were accepted as a marineer, might Caesar go with him? He would see, Father Paul promised, and he had gone to see. He returned with no positive answer, and Franz dared not press the issue. Surely the great prior of St. Bernard Hospice had problems far more important than whether to accept so insignificant a person as Franz Hale as a lay worker. Franz reached the tree he had already selected, felled it with clean strokes of his axe, and trimmed the branches. Cutting them into suitable lengths, he shouldered a bundle, tied another bundle on Caesar's strong back, and took them to Jean Greb's house. Jean greeted him pleasantly. He was a youngish man with wavy blonde hair and clear blue eyes. "'It is very kind of you to provide me with wood, Franz, when I find it so very difficult to provide my own.' "'It is my privilege,' Franz said. If I did not go out to cut wood, I would have to languish in idleness. Jean, who appeared to have some troublesome thought on his mind, seemed not to have heard. Will you come in and have some bread and cheese? he invited. Franz smiled. Gladly. Woodcutting works up an appetite. Franz dropped his own burden of wood and then relieved Caesar of his load. The big mastiff settled himself to wait until his master saw fit to rejoin him. Franz greeted Jean's pretty young wife and his three tousled-topped children, and seated himself opposite Jean at the family table. Jean's wife placed bread, milk, and cheese before them. Franz waited for his host to begin the meal, and became puzzled when Jean merely stared at the far wall. Something was indeed troubling him. Presently he explained. "'I once thought Dornblatt the finest place on earth,' he exclaimed bitterly. "'But there is a serpent among us.' The puzzled Franz said, "'I do not understand you.' "'Emil Gottschalk,' Jean burst out. "'The widow Geyser is heavily indebted to him, and now he says that if she does not pay the debt in full, and within ten days, he will take her farm and all else that is hers.' "'He cannot do such a thing,' the astounded Franz cried. "'Aye, but he can,' Jean said. "'Which is more, he will. 
and there's nothing any of us may do except offer asylum to the widow and her sons. A short time later, Franz walked gloomily homeward, his thoughts filled with the pleasant little farm and the attractive young woman who was fighting so valiantly to keep her home. If there was anything anyone could do, somebody would have done it. Professor Lutman was a very clever man. He would not let Emil Gottschalk take the Widow Geyser's farm if there was a way to forestall him. A week later, the snow came to Dornblatt. It whirled down so thickly that it was impossible to see more than a few yards in any direction, and it left fluffy drifts behind it. Eighteen hours later, there was another snow, and the people of Dornblatt took to their skis. The snowfall was followed by two days of fair weather, and then the first great storm of the winter came. It was so fierce that even the men of Dornblatt would not venture forth until it subsided. Franz was at the evening meal with his family when he heard Caesar's challenging roar. Footsteps sounded on the stairs. A moment later, Hermann Gottschalk, Emil's son, and Franz's former classmate, stumbled into the room. Father, he gasped, he is lost in the storm. End of chapter 3